Today we're joined by an actual ER doctor, so we can stop speculating for about 10 minutes about what's going on in the world and maybe get some real information. This is Dr. Jeff Gusky. He is a board certified ER doctor, National Geographic photographer. He's also an explorer and the gentleman obviously never sleep or sleeps <laughs> at all. How are you doing today, Dr. Jeff Gusky? I'm so glad to be with you. I hope you're safe and your audience is safe. I think everybody is kind of hoping to be too. And truthfully, I, speaking for myself, I'm uncertain. Everything is really, really uncertain in the world right now. What's going on? My day job, which I haven't had to go into except to go pick up a couple things here and there. Now they have three cases that have just popped up. So we're all a little ah, jittery with this whole coronavirus. And I wanted to bring you on to talk about what is going on? And you had a really strong message I heard with, it's the weather stupid. So let's start there. It's the weather stupid. It's the weather stupid. So here's, here's the, the meaning of that. Mm -hmm. You remember James Carville, the, it's the economy sure. stupid, and everyone knew what he was talking about. And this is Okay, for the like kids the out there, this was the during Bill Clinton's time. <laughs> yeah. Or, or the where's the beef, which was another election. So this is the this this is kind of the mantra of hope during the COVID era because it goes right to the core of what the problem is that no one's looking at right now and if we do we're going to be much safer. Uh, let me start by saying that we have to always cling to sober, realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. we started out the shutdown with with one singular mission which was that we avoid catastrophic death and collapse of the healthcare system. Right. And we've achieved that. And everyone should really feel good about the sacrifices and the teamwork and the, and the unselfishness that they have all done to, uh, to get to this point. But the initial goal has crept into fear and, and uncertainty and this, this you know, constant haranguing of all of us with uh, asking us to do things that, that are not very scientific, that are kind of winging it, that are, um, that are, are challenging whether we can trust our officials. Are the goalposts being moved? I guess would be the question. Yes. I, well, I think, I think what's happened is that it's all become politicized because I hate to say it, but there is a cottage industry in, in provoking rage and fear. Many of the large media companies, uh, their business plan is basically keeping people in constant, a constant state of post-traumatic stress. Breaking news, breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. Constant, it's constantly keeping people on the edge of, of fear, uncertainty, anger, rage. Everything's become very politicized. Mm. And politics needs to stay out of medicine. In the ER, there's never any right or left, black or white, gay or straight, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, religious or non-religious. It's just human. You can walk into any ER, it's the same way. And, and people are, are real. There, there's no PC, and PC is dangerous. Well, PC and, and political manipulation with COVID is very dangerous. Um, we need to insist upon clarity uh, in terms of the science behind the things we're being asked to do. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening right now. I feel like mm -hmm. we're on a precipice right now. Did I say that right? Precipices. Precipice. Precipice. Thank precipice. you. And yeah. do we open? Do we not open? So I put out to my group for the Unstructured Podcast on Facebook, and I said, hey, yeah. can I get some yeah. questions from everybody? And they delivered. So I've got Please a Please fire away. Start off with masks. Do masks with vents actually do anything? Masks with vents. They're selling vents. masks that like have vents in the side. Oh, okay. Look, let's go back to where the mask started. Okay. It was initially the Surgeon General said don't wear masks mm -hmm. for the general public, that they don't work. And he he I think he was factual. Now there are reasons to wear masks, and I'll get into that. But but let's go through the issue with masks as I see it. These are all my personal opinions. It's what I believe. It's not political. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to uh, to help people understand w the 
the science behind masks. So we start out with surgical masks. Where do they come from? They come from surgeons in the operating room mm -hmm. where you're, you're trying to protect a patient who is lying on the operating table with an open wound from getting infected when a surgeon might cough. And let's say that surgeon has bronchitis or, or strep throat or you know something sure. uh, infectious that could get into the wound and, and cause a surgical infection. So the surgical masks work reasonably well at protecting the others from an individual who's sick, uh, but they don't protect you from others. The air comes right in. The idea that, that a surgical mask is going to protect you from anybody is a myth. The facial coverings, look, so many people, let me frame this in a positive light because you have to look at the, the way that people have responded to this request that came all of a sudden out of the clear blue and people have been so unselfish and noble in, in trying to help others and be socially responsible. And there, we cannot say enough good about that. But from a science standpoint, in my view, the, the virus is so small, it, it goes right through surgical masks and, and face cloths and you know all of these very creative ways that people are covering their faces now. Okay, so, so now let's go to the N95. The N95 mask is supposed to protect you from others. It does kind of. What does N95 mean? It means that that mask, when it's worn properly, and when it is in, in, uh, in good shape, you know, you can't reuse them over and over and over. You can reuse them some, but it has to be uh, in working condition. It will filter out 95% of particles above 300 nanometers. Forgive me for being geeky. No, no, please go ahead. I'm a nerd. So 300 nanometers and above. Guess what size the virus is? It's, it's 60 to 140 nanometers. Mm. It's smaller than the particle size, the lower limit of the particles mm -hmm. that the N5 will filter out. Now, there is a circumstance where the masks help in that, that some of the particles, especially when someone coughs, mm -hmm. who has COVID, will be encapsulated in a micro droplet. And those are larger than the 300 nanometer limit, and they will likely be filtered out. But if it's a, a, a just a viral particle floating in, in the indoor dry air, an N95 is, is not even going to uh, protect you completely. Mm. It requires an N100, which is almost impossible to get right now. So in my view, the masks are important for healthcare providers or people in nursing homes or people, people who are in indoor spaces where there may be COVID exposure. Another application where you might consider an N95 is if you're getting on an airplane. Mm. Although airplane air, though there are some problems with it, there are a lot of good things about airplane air as well that, that people are not talking about and that I, I think make us much safer in, in, in that air because of the turnover and the HEPA filters. So you have to look at mask, social distancing, and then the most important thing that no one's talking about, that the risk of COVID is very, very different indoors versus outdoors. And the irony of it all is that we live 90% of the time indoors and now 100% of the time indoors uh, for many of us because we've been asked to shelter in place. Mm -hmm. And guess where the danger is? It's indoor. The hotspot, the best hope that we have, and, and it's important in dealing with the emotions of, of this COVID marathon that we're in, is that we prevent society from having catastrophic viral outbreaks that lead to massive loss of life and collapse of the healthcare system. In other words, that we flatten the curve. If we do that, that's the best we can hope for. We cannot get rid of the virus until a vaccine or the virus burns out. And so when we hear the news with these outbreaks that are gonna be happening, they get used to it. Any of us can get COVID. And, and the good news is that most of us will do just fine. It's about 10, 15% where the, uh, the bad things happen. Think about this. You know, for years we've lived with flu and no one bothered to do social distancing to, you know, the hand washing, the not shaking of hands. You know, uh, and, and so all that we're doing now is having a strong impact 
on lowering the transmission rate with COVID. But some of us are still going to get it. So now let's talk about let's let's talk about the weather. So why is it the weather stupid? Let's start with relative humidity. So if you look at a chart of Wuhan relative humidity, it looks like Florida. It's about 75 to 80 percent, 12 months a year. Here's the big surprise is that when you look at this other metric of humidity, which is not relative humidity, it's it's a little bit related, but mostly not. It's mm. not something you can measure at home. It's not something reported on the weather service, but they can report it. My mission is to get them to report it. Mm -hmm. It's another geeky metric. And if you want to learn about it very quickly, go to Google and type in humidity helps fight flu. And there's a brilliant 60 second science podcast from Scientific American from 2009. This data has been around for a long time that says we've been looking at the wrong metric to understand indoor airborne spread of viral disease. And, and so it's this other geeky metric. So when you look at Wuhan for that metric, oh my God, it was the indoor air in Wuhan was bone dry when a small viral outbreak exploded into a massive viral catastrophe. And then you look at New York and you look at Detroit and you look at even New Orleans. It's the last place people would think that a, uh, a, a viral problem related to dangerously dry indoor air would, would lead to a viral bomb. But tragically, when you look at the two peak days of Mardi Gras this year, there was some weather pattern. It may have been a cold front or something that came in and it changed the normally humid weather into dangerously dry indoor air. And that's why the bomb went off in New Orleans. You've also mentioned meat packing plants, I believe, that they have very Pack dry air because of the air conditioning. Exactly. because and, and so if you look at the common thread behind every single outbreak, I believe, it's this. It's that you have high population density indoors plus virus plus dangerously dry indoor air. Okay, now let's talk about why the weather affects the indoors. So when you, this metric, which is a measure of the amount of water in the air, it has, it's not relative humidity, it's something else. And so that metric actually correlates very well with indoor air because buildings breathe, even high rises that are sealed off, that seem almost hermetically sealed, they, they are connected to the outdoors. And so when the outdoor humidity, amount of water in the air drops low, it affects the indoor air. And then when you couple that with wintertime, where you have the heat on, and it really dries it out. Washington State, where the first outbreak occurred, if you look at when the, uh, in that nursing home, when the viral bomb went off and go back about 12 or 14 days, mm -hmm. There was a uh, weather system that came through and made the ordinarily very humid air dry. I think it was actually even in the middle of the night. You can have what I call red days or even red hours. And so the, the part of going back to the, the mindset of what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. part of why our lives are turned upside down is because we were fighting a war against an enemy that we cannot see. And we have to make invisible danger visible right now. It's critical. And that's why I'm pushing hard for one of the big weather services. And I've really tried to reach Byron Allen at the Weather Channel. I haven't heard back from him. Also AccuWeather, also IBM, which owns the Weather Underground. Any one of those sources could in overnight prove that dangerously dry indoor air was a predicate or a component of every single viral bomb that went off. And what I'm talking about with viral bomb is you have a small outbreak that uh, in indoors that suddenly is it becomes a massive viral catastrophe. And so the, the worst places are nursing homes because in those places you have people who are very old with co with premorbid uh, I'm sorry premorbid uh, conditions with comorbidities right. and and so they're extremely vulnerable the physiology of aging makes us more vulnerable to covid and then when you add uh, these uh, comorbidities it makes those people extremely vulnerable 
And so that's why you have nursing homes and long care, uh, long-term care facilities, prisons, and meatpacking plants as the places where we see most of the of the terrible catastrophes happening. That makes sense, and I think somebody had released that an extremely high percentage of the deaths in New York all had comorbidity of some kind, be it hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity. They had something going with it. Let's, let's talk about New York. So uh, New York is an absolute tragedy in that you know the officials were almost arrogantly saying, don't worry about it. We've got everything under control. Go, you know, do live your normal life. All the while, you know, their city was being seeded with people coming from uh, the hot spots in Europe, and it was tragic. Now, what did New York look like when you look at the the dangerously dry indoor air? It was probably, by my estimate, perhaps twice as dangerous as Wuhan. It was that dry. That's one. Secondly. You have high population density in high rises, and, and there's some question in my mind that in in some of these spaces that you may have central heating that could have passed the virus from one level to the next to the next, and then uh, third, you have inner city poverty, and and the 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 tragedies amongst minorities, in particular African Americans, have been attributed to the, the, the well-known health disparities in inner city poor, whether it's high blood pressure, or obesity, or uh, chronic uh, heart disease, or smoking, or, you know, it's a whole panoply of, of conditions. But there's something new, and I'm going to share it with your audience, and it is not in the news yet. And, and I think we actually released a press release on Sunday I just happened to stumble on this on Friday when looking at a physician's update on COVID. And it's very hard to understand, it's, it's very technical, but in a nutshell, it was the first time that, that there was data showing that the, the tragic disparities of, of death and, and bad outcomes with African Americans, with blacks, is not just from inner city poverty. It turns out that that there is a genetic vulnerability that also is tied to this news about children that is starting to come out who are experiencing death from multi-organ failure. And yesterday there was a, um, a headline that went all over the world fast related to men having um, a vulnerability related to an enzyme, and all three of these situations are linked. There, it turns out that the virus attacks uh, what's called an angiotensin II receptor, and uh, that it puts that that receptor out of business, basically. And that receptor is very important because it keeps other receptors from going haywire. You know, when we think of cancer, what is cancer? It's where cells go haywire. Well, there's Another form of haywire involving um, the immune system and chemicals that are produced in the body that attack our organs. And uh, they're called superoxidases. And they attack the blood set, the blood vessels, and they produce intense vasculitis and thrombosis and blood clots all over the place. And, and it, it, it is a nightmare scenario. And, and this is the re I'm, I'm really upset. I've had a great deal, and I still have a great deal of respect for the medical doctors that are working tirelessly to help us through this crisis. But I feel now that it's become politicized. And why is it that an ER doc who is on the, who's a front, I'm not a basic scientist, I'm not in a research lab, you know, but, but I could put this together. And why in the hell have not the doctors that are leading this put this together long ago? Because had we known about the link with dangerously dry indoor air to Wuhan and every single hotspot since, I believe, we, I believe we could have sh- avoided the shutdown of America and saved tens of thousands of lives. And, and now that we have this story emerging about children that are that are dying from multi-organ failure and the, the vulnerability that explains why 
African American death rates are significantly higher. It goes to, it's actually a similar pathway to the problem of high blood pressure that is also a genetic vulnerability in African Americans. And, and so we need to go into overdrive, just like we did with ventilators and PPE six weeks ago, on a wartime footing to get indoor air, what I call green, to get indoor air safe because we are only five months away from flu season. And when that happens, it's, we're gonna be lulled. Between now and then, we're going to, we're going to have um, a seeming respite. And it's because of the weather, because as you go from spring to summer, you have more green days than red, and, and it makes the indoor air relatively safer. But, but that's going to flip back into danger in, in the fall, and there are inner city poor, there are people in nursing homes, there are sure. meat packing plants, there are prisons, you know, there are so many places, there are all the businesses that, that have closed that could reopen if people feel safe by knowing that the danger of dry indoor air has been mitigated, and it's so easy to do. So let me use Florida as an example. So we've heard about the fantastic success of the Florida governor and the Florida health officials and all the courageous Floridians who did such a great job. They were proactive in, in testing people going into nursing homes and in being very, very careful about limiting the most or access to the most vulnerable patients. And the projections about a nightmare scenario, an apocalypse in Florida because of all the elderly turned out to be just the opposite. And they have the lowest death rates among elderly. Have you heard about that, Eric? I have not, I have not, but that's good okay. to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, it, it's an amazing success story, but I believe that a lot of it, and, and not to discredit the governor or, or the courageous people in Florida at all, but, because they did great, but mm -hmm. it's also the weather, because Florida has ambient weather outdoors that makes the indoor air naturally more safe against COVID. Mm. Even with air conditioning, it's safer. And I believe that a significant reason why COVID deaths have been less in Florida is because the indoor air is safer in a natural way. So how is it that we can create safety everywhere? We can. Uh, I came up with a paradigm called Humidity saves lives, which is a simple plan to keep us safe. And it, it first begins with making invisible danger visible. And second, it, it's making that invisible danger safe by adding water to the air we breathe indoors until indoor humidity is 50 to 60% round the clock until the crisis is passed. And relative, it's because that, that's what we can measure. That's where that's a starting point. But but the the part one of the humidity saves lives, is actually a new vital sign of viral safety, which I want to see on every weather report every day around the clock around the world. And it's where they report this geeky metric that can actually forecast ahead of time red air or dangerously dry indoor air in time for us to do something like about it. Like an allergy it. index so, or UV index. Exactly, an index, heat index, allergy index, it gives people advanced warning of viral danger indoors in time to make their home safe. And so what a difference that will be for all of us in terms of elevating our morale and our sense of hope and our sense of identifying the, ener the enemy that we're fighting just by having the viral safety index on the weather report. Mm -hmm. Because the, there are three things that happen when, when the air is in that 50 to 60% range. One involves person-to-person -person spread. Mm -hmm. So, in, in, and, and it's so simple and it's not new science. There's an abundance of science that's been out for years. The physics of, um, of dry indoor air enables viral particles to travel all the way across a room and to linger for hours. In moist air, it's almost like social distancing on steroids. It's like a firewall that prevents the virus from going very far because there's friction and there's, there's resistance to flow when you have moist. It's an invisible protective barrier against COVID when you have moist uh, uh, water in the air that's in the range of 50 to 60% relative humidity indoors. 
I want to clarify though, uh, before we go too deep in it, because yes. I still want to know, don't you still need to social distance? Even if you have the protective barrier, that doesn't mean you should be leaning on each other in the bar necessarily, right? Okay. Well, okay. This is, this is where science need, I, you know, we've been spending all of this time fighting over testing. Mm. Mass testing is, is, is actually, in my view, dangerous. And the same with, with all the promises about, about tracing and treatment, mm -hmm. you know, testing, trace and treatment. It's like a mantra that you keep hearing on television by politicians who, who are getting, they're, they're politicizing healthcare. In, a, in my view, in a dangerous way. So let's go back to your, your very astute question. We don't know the answer. I, I know that, first of all, I know for sure that viral outbreaks outdoors, I, I, in fact, I've not heard of a single outbreak becoming a bomb outdoors because outdoor air is much different than indoor air. It dilutes, there's sunlight that, that uh, makes the viruses non-viable very quickly. And the physics of air outside are just totally different. Mm -hmm. So whoever came up with this six foot number, I feel like they, they pulled it out of you know, their hat. I don't know if there's really good science that, yeah. I, you know, and we have people being arrested, we have fights breaking out, sure. we have you know, so much tension over this six foot number now, indoors, in dangerously dry indoor air, six foot may, may not be enough mm -hmm. if it's dry. If the air is green, it may be plenty. I don't know. We need rapidly to look at the science of humidity that is in the 50 to 60 percent range, or in terms of this metric, it should be above 10 grams per meter cube. That's the amount of water in the air. It should mm -hmm. be, I mean, ideally 10 to 13, 14, in that range. But you do uh, agree uh, that we shouldn't treat it, even if the air, let's say, does magically get to that level, everybody pays attention and does it, we still probably should practice a little bit of uh, hygiene just in case. Oh, oh definitely hand washing. And, and, and until this crisis is passed, it's probably not a good idea to shake hands. Mm. In terms of the distancing... You know, this, there's utter paranoia and fear now because we've all been indoctrinated with the idea that there's something magic about six feet. Here's why I believe that mass testing is dangerous. And, and so the backdrop is that we've all been cooped up. You know, we want to feel safe and we want to feel a degree of certainty about, about our lives, about the future, about, you know, the places that we are working and, and shopping and living. Mm -hmm. We've been told that mass testing is going to make us safe. That, for example, returning to work, you know, that everybody needs tested. I, I don't get it. I just personally don't get it because um, you can, all that a test means is that you're negative at the time the test was sure. done. Could you be infected an hour later? Yes. Could you be infected the next day? Yes. So when people have all of this pent up desire to have their lives back, to feel certainty and safety, and they get a, a normal test, they're gonna think, okay, now I've got the good housekeeping seal of approval to go hug grandma. Mm. And it's human nature that you know, three, four, five days after the test, you're gonna say, oh, you're gonna rationalize, I'm fine. Right. And you're going to be affectionate towards you know, a, a person that you love who is at risk. And that is going to potentially give COVID to somebody that you love. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, of, of the, the misunderstanding about mass testing. Now, targeted testing is extremely important. I have a view that every person going into a nursing home, whether it's healthcare workers or visitors mm -hmm. or plumbers or whoever, should be tested every time they go in, Right. at least every day. Uh, I heard about New York saying twice a week. I don't get that. I think it should be every day mm -hmm. that people go into a nursing home, they should be tested. I think that frontline health care workers need to be frequently tested. Bus drivers, anybody working in enclosed spaces where you're around a lot of people, um, where you could be exposed, and then you could in turn be asymptomatic and expose others, you need to be tested frequently. If you're on a Navy ship or if you're in a meatpacking plant, those situations, you need to be tested. But, but that, 
those situations are very specific scenarios mm -hmm. where people are in indoor air at risk. Those are not the ordinary work situation. We have to reset our expectations around what's real. We have to go back to where we shut down the country to avoid catastrophic death and the collapse of the healthcare system and realize that that is the best that we can do. We are not going to eradicate the virus. Well, now to move forward, because I do have a lot of questions that I want to hit. And some of these, I, I think are very important, actionable steps or questions that people have, and you could hopefully answer. I'll do my best. All right, let's start off with how much of a risk is getting packages slash fast food, things like that delivered? And is it risky? Is it not risky? And then what should people do about it? Should they, how should they decontaminate it? Okay, so I don't know the exact answer. And, uh, you know, there was a New York Times article that I felt was, was really irresponsible that was talking about viruses lasting 72 hours on cardboard or something like that. You know, the, the, first of all, let's get clear about uh, the difference between viruses and bacteria. Viruses do not live. They, bacteria are living organisms. They, they metabolize, they, they oxygenate, they excrete you know, waste products. Viruses are just a piece of RNA with a coat. They don't live. So what you need to know, or the question you need to ask is how long will a viral particle be infective? In sunlight, they quickly denature. In moist air, they quickly, or relatively quickly denature. They, they don't last very long in moist air. Mm -hmm. You know, we go out to a grocery store, we touch something, we come into our homes, and now we're worried about contaminating the sacred space that we live in. And that's, that is eerie, mm -hmm. almost unnerving that, that the very place where you, you feel safe, you, you're now worried about this hidden enemy attacking you exactly. that you can't see. And it's driving people nuts. I think people should just do good hand washing, common sense, you know, when you come home, wash your hands. And by the way, you don't need to have Purell or, you know, antibacterial soap, even though that's what I use, to be honest. But, okay. but uh, it's, it's, it's not, these aren't bacteria, they don't live. Plain soap and water is what you need. So I want to say something that's going to sound really like I'm lying. Until COVID, I did not know how to wash my hands. So this person said, well, wait a minute. That sounds, that sounds uh, unbelievable because you have done surgery. Well, surgery, we have a brush. You know, we, we have a routine that we go through. Okay, but you're not washing your hands with a surgeon's brush. Neither am I. And so because of COVID uh, and, and a a medical podcast, I learned there are seven steps and it's brilliant. Okay, so here's the first step. You go like this, mm -hmm. you know, flat surface, okay? So it's the palms of your and hands. Plain soap and water, palms of, of your hands. Mm -hmm. Then you go like this. Between your fingers. Okay? Your fingers, and actually I do one over as well. Okay. Okay, like that, that's step two. Got it. Then the third step is this from behind. Okay, so one hand like over the other, uh, palm to right. the back of the hand. Yeah, that's three. Okay. okay. Third step is, all, our fourth step is also two parts. It's your fingertips. You go like this, okay. and then you go like that. Like you're turning a doorknob into your palm? Yeah, exactly. And that's your fingertips. Fifth step is your knuckles. Okay, rubbing like your knuckles that. on your palm. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sixth step is your thumbs, and you go all the way down like that. Okay, up and down the thumb. Yeah, all the way to the base. And then the seventh step is your wrist. You go like that. Okay. Just And that's it. That's, that's the COVID hand wash. Mm. And, uh, and it's, I thought it was so smart when I saw this. And I, that's what I do now every time, when, so when I come in. But um, just plain soap and water, the virus, look, COVID for all of its, of its infectiousness. It has vulnerabilities. I want to continue. My wife is a library director and she gets books that are returned. What should she do about those? Just leave them sit for a day and they'll be good? I, I don't think, I don't, I don't have the answer. And I don't think that, that you know, we're going to drive each, all of us crazy if we, if we have to worry about imagining hidden virus everywhere. It's right. going to make everyone OCD. And, and we're, you know, people are, it's already causing so much problems in terms of mental health and suicides sure. and depression. Sure. And 
look, you cannot just elevate the air, use good hand washing, social distancing. And, and I think that by and large, you're going to be fine. What are you doing yourself and your peers to keep yourself safe since you're right in the middle of it? Okay, the, so now we're going to go into some controversy. I, w I saw the study on hydroxychloroquine early on, mm -hmm. within days. The famous French infectious disease doctor that was seeing these amazing results in terms of viral clearance when he combined hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax. At first, you know, I wonder why Zithromax? It's an antibacterial, but apparently it has antiviral properties as well. Mm. Unfortunately, that medicine has been so politicized, and I believe that it's criminal the way that, that doctors that looked at this, you know, are so angry at that study. It was, I think it was a hit job intentionally because the doctor that apparently did the study never took care of a COVID patient. He's a research ophthalmologist. Which study was that? The so-called VA study VA, okay. that uh, against hydroxychloroquine. They didn't publish dosages. There were just so many things wrong with it. They were, they were looking at people who were already in a cytochrome storm and in a very end stage state and saying, well, it didn't work. Well, nothing would work at that point. Now we have remdesivir, which gives us some hope. But the, the point is that hydroxychloroquine has been around for about 70 years. Mm -hmm. Tens and tens and tens of millions of people have taken it. Millions of people every year as anti-malarial prophylaxis, as a medication for lupus or for rheumatoid arthritis. The rheumatologist, to my knowledge, who have used it for decades and decades, they, they, they many of them report n never having a, a significant complication. They don't do EKGs. Theoretically, it can prolong the QT interval, and which is not a heart attack, but it's something. It's mm -hmm. I won't go into it, but it's it. There are a lot of things that theoretically can prolong the QT interval, but in terms of of um, of the way that that drug has been used successfully in mass populations, it has a very well established safety profile. And so I can tell you a story. I have a very dear friend who is a cardiothoracic surgeon whose wife has uh, lupus and has been on that drug for years. How did she feel when all of a sudden the news is reporting that people on hydroxychloroquine is getting heart attacks? It was totally irresponsible and, and, and frightening people who need that drug for lupus and, and rheumatoid and for anti-malarial. You know, a lot of my Nat Geo colleagues take it when we go into malarial prone regions. Soldiers. It's a very take common it. drug. Soldiers, Vietnam era soldiers. Yeah. So to go back to your question, what am I doing is I, I got on hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax and, and most of the ER docs and the frontline docs in intensive care units that I know of did the same. Okay. And they just don't talk about it because it's so political now. I don't know. I mean, I just know what they did and what I did. And, and, and it, it's, it's, it's criminal that, you know, I, I'm sorry to use that word. It's a very strong word, but politicians need to stay the hell out of medicine, right or left. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, we need to try to do the right thing. We're at war against a, an invisible enemy. And in war, you do things differently. You, if, if something might help and it won't hurt, you go for it because you fight the battle with the tools that you have. That makes total sense. Um, for one of the questions I had is, you know, like, when do we know that we should check ourselves out? And one thing that I heard is um, blood oxygen monitors could be useful. Okay, okay, let's talk about that. So when I, I did this Zoom session, two sessions actually, for Nat Geo colleagues around the world on Thursday, and we had to do two because there are a lot of people in different time zones. And, and so the only, what I told them was the only time I would recommend buying a pulse ox is if you're, let's say out in the middle of nowhere, eight hours from the closest healthcare, working out in the field, and you feel like you're getting sick or you, you, you know, you've been around someone that turns out to have COVID and you want to know when you need to seek medical care, when you'd go drive that eight hours through the bush in order to get healthcare. 
Mm-hmm. Well, then, you, you know, the pulse ox makes sense. Oh, by the way, let me, t- before I forget, there is a Yale Healthcare um, has a, a protocol online about hydroxychloroquine. Guess what their first line drug is for their inpatients? It's hydroxychloroquine. This is Yale. Mm. Yale. And that was May 1st, the last time I looked at it. Mm. So 11 days ago, it was, their, it was their first line drug for hospitalized patients who were meeting. And what made me think of it was when you're asking about the oxygen level. So mm. if you have, so COVID does something really strange with a certain segment uh, or a certain cohort of the patients that get it. And it, it, it causes the oxygen levels to drop you know, in a way that we've never quite seen before. And so people can have oxygen levels in the low 80s or even the mid 70s, and ordinarily they would be comatose or delirious, uh, and they'd start to have organ perfusion problems. And these people are perfusing their organs, Mm. and they're talking to you. You know, the, the science behind this is not clear, but if you are out in the field and you feel like you have it, and what I told my my colleagues is, um, if you start to go down into the 80s, like the mid 80s, you know, then drive in and get health care. Or if you're, let's say, 90 and you exercise and your and your pulse ox drops, your pulse oximeter drops by three points when you're exerting yourself, that would be another criteria. But but otherwise, I would not buy a pulse ox because you're just going to drive yourself crazy. Don't try to play doctor. Because it's COVID is way more complicated than than you can figure out by looking at the internet. It is a complex disease, and most of the people that you know, there, right now there is no official treatment except for remdesivir on an an, an emergency authorization only. Mm-hmm. So the remdesivir is a medicine for people who are really really sick in an ICU or in, in a hospital. Who makes that? Um, I can't. I think it's Gilead. Is that a government-funded um, medicine now, or I don't know. I don't. I don't know the details, but I know that Gilead has received a lot of praise for pulling out all the stops and getting it, you know, produced and giving a lot of it away. And okay. so I, that's what I've heard. I don't know the details. Is it better but than the other controversial mix, or is it just an alternative? It's the only thing that, that has any FDA approval, to my knowledge, right now. And it's just for really, really sick patients. It's not something that, you know, you you t- there is no other treatment for COVID right now, um, except for things that are off label like hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax. Right. And by the way, that that doctor finished, I think, an, about 1,100 patients several weeks ago, put together a non-randomized study, but I think he had an almost 92% rate of viral clearance. Wow. It was pretty remarkable numbers. There were seven or eight deaths and I think one complication out of 1,100 patients. So uh, it was very good numbers. And, and I think there are other studies that are there undoubtedly that are coming out now. But, but you have to be very careful in what you're hearing uh, in the news. Uh, it, there is a lot of misinformation with numbers, with statistics. Uh, that's a question I had, actually, that there's some question of there's overinflated uh, numbers about oh, deaths. Oh, they're all over the map. They're all over the map. And it's a lot of it is designed to create fear and panic, in my view. And it's irresponsible. So some people would say the only number we can count on is the death number. Okay, at least in the United States, where we have fairly accurate reporting of deaths. But even in the U.S., that number, as we're discovering, can be high or low. A lot of states have politicized it, and, and doctors are being pressured to write uh, COVID on the death certificate when it's maybe COVID, but it's probably a heart attack or I something see. like that. That was a question, too. If somebody came in with a brain aneurysm but also had COVID, what would be the cause? Yeah, they're blaming it on COVID, I see. and, and it's, it, it's politicized, and it's unfortunate. That's not always happening, but I understand that it's happening and that's that's an example where politics has intervened with medicine and it's giving us skewed numbers. They're also underreporting with people in nursing homes or homeless or you know people dying at home. They may not be accurately reporting those as as COVID deaths. So it's it's not as tight as we want it to be. And and then 
in terms of these numbers about recovery and how many people, what percent have it and death rates, we can't trust those numbers because we don't know what the denominator is. How many people actually have COVID? What, what we kind of assume, and I think personally, I believe this is the case, is that way more people have had it uh, than we know. That's our hope, isn't it? That's actually a good thing. The more people who have had it, the better. So, so that, that goes into another um, area of uncertainty because we don't know right now whether having antibodies protects you from another COVID attack. Okay. And, and there are reports of people who have antib- the IgG antibody, mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, or at least the IgM antibody, who are still shedding virus. So it's, it's a, co- you know, the, 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 uh, in fact, the FDA took the um, antibody test off the market, or they, they require, they're requiring them to now be certified because there were so many scams and so many tests that that cropped up out of out of nowhere out of control you know that were that were being highly commercial taking advantage of people you didn't know what the numbers meant they weren't standardized and mm-hmm. so now the f has has kind of put the the kibosh on that and and they're restarting that whole program and and so in terms of um, uh, let me just go through uh, at least as of last Thursday, I haven't checked since, but, and the, this COVID thing for doctors is the same as for everyone else. We all feel like the ground is shifting. What was true yesterday is not true today in many cases. It's, we've never seen anything like it. So the ordinary public should know that doctors are going through the same sense of, of you know, walking quicksand. Yeah, like everything's changing. And, and, but when you accept that, and in fact, I want to say something that I love. Uh, just to, it, it's very calming. It, when the power of the modern world disappears, all we have left is each other. And, and that really, that's what we can count on is each other. And we see that in such an amazing way. We see incredible altruism. That's what we can count on right now is each other. Other human beings helping other human beings, complete strangers, risking their lives to save the lives of complete strangers. And, and that is the most remarkable, beautiful thing. There's this vast reservoir of human decency and goodness that lies just beneath the surface. And it erupts like a volcano. We don't even know it's there until a crisis. And then we see you know, what our country is made of. And it's never about race or about gay, straight, or rich, poor, or any of these isms. It's just human beings helping human beings. Actually, you know what? That is a perfect, perfect message to wrap on. I, I just love ending on hope like that. So I'm hopeful. And please be hopeful. And please write your state and local and national leaders and tell them, it's the weather, stupid. <laughs> Dr. Jeff Gusky, thank you so much. People can find you at jeffgusky.com. Yes. They can also go on YouTube. Uh, and uh, I'm posting, There's, I have a show at the Smithsonian, or I'm part of a show at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. They can learn about that on, on YouTube. I'm also posting a lot on LinkedIn, doing a lot of interviews. Fantastic. And I'm pushing to get the viral safety index on every weather report. And, and, and to get indoor air safe as fast as possible. Let's try and make Thanks. that happen.